Okay. Okay. Uh, you guys hear me all right? I think I have some mic. Oh, you want me to speak loud, slow? Is it okay? You're good. Perfect. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Satish Mehta. I am a senior uh, scientist working uh, on space life sciences for the last 24 years. Um, I have my background in biochemistry, microbiology, and then later on, I got a little experience working with the infectious diseases. So that is what I have really have a lot of experience and a lot of uh, reading and uh, knowledge that I have gathered, you know, which uh, now I apply with the, some of the research activities we do. Um, that's all about myself. So now I'll talk uh, some of the things, you know, you all are here to listen to. So my talk is going to be a little bit different. I don't know, you know, what kind of life sciences uh, uh, talks you have been um, hearing, you know, during this session. But this is going to be directly related with crew health and performance. Uh, you know that, you know, we are here at NASA for crew safety and health, and the research what we do it has to be applied in such a way that it makes an impact on crew health. If we are doing so many basic biology, you know, so then there are a lot of universities, you know, they would entertain those kinds of things. Here, we do need to do some biology. It has to be, the basis has to be biology, but eventually, you know, it is related with crew health. And uh, <clears throat> um, could it be a little informal session? Can I ask you a question and you can ask me, you know? I mean, let's make it a fun rather than, you know, and that will, it will give me a little break also. I just want to ask some of you maybe, are you guys familiar, familiar with viruses, latent viruses or herpes viruses? Anybody? Yeah. Right? You know? Okay. Herpes viruses, you know, these are, you know, we all have, you know, people normally get really confused when you talk about herpes. Oh my God, you know, you're talking about herpes. Okay. There are many kinds of herpes viruses, you know, and, uh, you know, there are eight different herpes viruses, you know, that infect healthy human being without causing any problem. So it doesn't mean that, you know, if you have herpes, you know, so you are, you are something different. So uh, we are actually trying to focus our discussion today on these herpes viruses. And uh, these viruses are latent in the body. And I'll explain a little bit more, you know, during my talk what I mean by latent. And the studies we have done, or the research we have done, or the knowledge we have gained by doing space flight experiments are uh, now applied uh, to the patients. So that really makes uh, you know, us look a little bit good that you know, whatever work we do here at NASA is applicable to the human health. On the, uh, so so, so I, as I go, you know, I'll keep. Uh, uh, before we go too far uh, into this discussion, I just want to make sure, you know, all the things, you know, I'll be talking today, this actually is a huge collaborative effort, you know, that uh, is starts here at NASA, JSC, Houston, USA, all over the country, you know, have collaborators all over the country, you know, you know, speaking, I mean, talking of NIH, University of Colorado, um, CDC, and of course, you know, I do have international uh, collaborations also. Because the kind of work we do, it is very unique. I'm very excited. Every day I come to work, I'm looking forward to doing something new, you know. That really gives me excitement of what I do because, you know, you cannot do, you don't have an opportunity of doing this kind of work anywhere other than NASA. So that makes it very unique. And also, I'm very proud of discussing my work, you know, every time I go out for a meeting. I'm not worried about you know, somebody stealing my idea and reproducing that because they don't have astronauts, and I do. <laughs> so I mean, that makes it very unique. And uh, you know, so, uh, so it's, it's, it's a huge effort by And uh, we do work uh, um, in a microbiology lab of Building 37. And tomorrow, I think you know, we are going to take you guys on a tour you know, to show you what we do. So this is a day-to-day -day activity in the lab, you know, with different people helping. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm trying to focus my study. I'll be discussing, you know, during this talk, uh, three main items. 
Uh, number one is the latent herpes viruses. Two, stress, space flight. And third, application to the clinical studies. Uh, <clears throat> let us talk about herpes viruses first. As I said, you know, herpes viruses, there are eight different herpes viruses. They uh, actually, there are a number of different herpes viruses, but there are eight human herpes viruses. Uh, you get infected, you know, when you are little, you know, when you are young. Say, for example, you had chicken pox at the age of two, three, uh, or even before that, and that is the primary infection. So, chicken pox is caused by one of the viruses, you know, that is herpes viruses, that is, you know, VCV, varicella zoster virus. So after a couple of weeks, you know, a person feels miserable, you know, during those, you know, week or two time, you know, when the disease is really active. And uh, after a couple of weeks, you know, person feels all right, uh, symptoms are over and no problem. However, virus doesn't leave the body. The virus stays in your body for the rest of your life. And later on, you know, uh, it could be anything, you know, it could be stress, it could be you know, depressed immune system, excitement, any kind of stress, any kind of uh, increased stress hormones, you know, any kind of anxiety, uh, that can cause those viruses to re-activate, uh, you know, and uh, start producing symptoms. But uh, <clears throat> these are DNA viruses, and uh, uh, basically, there are three different kinds of viruses, you know, alpha herpes viruses, beta herpes viruses, and gamma. And I'm sure you all are familiar with, you know, HSV 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And uh, we'll, uh, as I go uh, along, I'll, I'll, I'll keep discussing each of these viruses. And uh, uh, again, you know, the purpose of uh, this talk or the purpose of my whole, whole studies here at NASA is to use this as a tool because you know every time I go out for a meeting you know if this is a biology or a viral related meeting you know and I have my name and with NASA over there people ask me a very simple question and it's, it's very obvious viruses why why NASA has to be interested in viruses so let's keep that question in mind and I'll ex explain to that later well, why herpes? I mean, exactly very good question why herpes um, so it's like that um, as I said, you know, there are eight different herpes viruses, right? And we all are infected. Uh, the question is, uh, why NASA is interested? Because these viruses are under a control of intact immune system, okay? So if you are happy, healthy, these viruses are there. I just gave you an example of one of those viruses, you know, due to chickenpox. Uh, so this was one out of eight. So what happens is, you know, if this virus is in your body and you are a healthy individual, you know, you have no problem. That virus is going to stay over there. However, you know, in any case of excitement, stress, changes of immunity, age, you know, which we all are running against, every one of us, you know, so as we age, you know, our immune system goes down. So all those factors, you know, they cause this immune system to have a little bit lesser control on these viruses which are already sitting in the body causing nothing. So once that thing goes down, these viruses go up and then they start to start to release in the body fluids. So you see these viruses in different body fluids, you know, that includes saliva, urine, blood and all those kinds of things. And these viruses, you know, when you study, say now, now I'm, I'm, I'm coming to your question directly. So when we study those viruses in the environment of NASA, those viruses give us an indication, oh, so you have viruses in your saliva or in your blood in the larger amount than it's expected in the normal human being. So that means there is something going on, you know, maybe with the immune system, maybe with the endocrine system, maybe with the combination of the two. So this actually is an indirect test uh, uh, or indirect biomarker of, 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 of finding uh, the intact immune system. So, um, I'll give you, show you some data also to support this because, you know, this was, this needed me to give you a little more information, but I already explained to you, you know, I have given you the punchline, but I'm going to be supporting this punchline, you know, coming back to this again and again. Did I explain your question? Yeah, Did I answer yeah, it? Okay. It's a flag, it's a bio flag. So, you, you have an indication of whether your immune system be weakened or not based on 
on the virus activation or Yeah, that's 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 right. You know, the, but the second part of, of of this question is again, you know, you would say, and NASA also says us, you know, okay, you know, immune system. If it immune system goes down, and if our astronauts are happy, healthy, we why do we worry about that? It happens all the time, you know. So if you study one uh, kind of cell of the immune system that goes down during space flight and it comes back you know after the landing and during recovery period and astronauts feel happy and healthy then you know it is just kind of a curiosity this is like a research uh, interest you know we had you know so i had this grant i'm working on that and this was a you know pretty good uh, information i got but does it really relate with crew health it does so I'll explain more on that. So this is this is one of the examples. You know, this is one of the pictures. You know how this herpes virus is. This is EBV virus. EBV. Uh, you know, as I said, you know these primary infections. You know, once you have a primary infection, you are sitting. These 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 viruses sit in the body for a long period of time, and they start to go into your central nervous system. Cerebrospinal fluid is one of the fluid. You know where people use. I mean. I'm just trying to sh give you, you know, how extensively difficult it is to study these viruses in the real uh, human beings. I mean, you have to take CSF, you know, you have to take cerebrospinal fluid, or you know, it's it's not easy. There is no test available, uh, but until until we had some really, you know, remarkable some studies, you know, we did at NASA, and that has really changed that whole thing, and I. So, so, so these viruses, but you know, the reactivation is the thing you know which I'm trying to be focusing more. And it's a well-known fact. This it it can many factors can trigger this reactivation. Uh, that includes stress, infection, radiation in the space, and uh, other things. Um, here is a now, um, you know, eight different herpes viruses, and they all are related with one or the other disease. Uh, I don't want to bore you too much with what each virus is doing, but some of these viruses, like say for example HSV1, you know, so we have seen cases due to HSV1 in the space flight environment. You know, these are the cold sores, you know, fever blisters. You know, you you all, you know, one or the other time you may have had in your lifetime. Um, EBV, you know, 90% of healthy human individuals, you know, they are infected with EBV. This is Epstein-Barr virus. You know, this this is also caused infectious mononucleosis. Um, um, if you if you remember, you know, the story of Bubble Boy. You know, he was here in Houston. So that Bubble Boy, you know, so he got infected by EBV from uh, one of the transfusions he had, you know, from his sister, and died of EBV EBV lymphoma. Um, then uh, VCV is another very important virus, you know, we actually target on. So that is varicella zoster virus. Uh, chickenpox is not a problem at NASA in the age group we deal because, you know, they are healthy adult individuals, you know, and chickenpox is a disease of children. Uh, but not always true, actually. I just had a case of chickenpox in 45-year-old women. So. I mean, it's not always true, but you know, VCV shingles is another thing, you know, which uh, if you have heard, you know, so shingles is a disease of elderly, uh, so that's caused by by varicella zoster virus. So that is what we focus on. Uh, here is uh, uh, an example of uh, these two lesions. Uh, if you look at that, you know. Um, this this HSV1 or this herpes virus lesion, uh, this is a different type of lesion as is the shingles lesion. So herpes virus lesion, you know, so these are the blisters, you know, they form a round shape. Uh, even though both of them are caused by the same virus, one is primary infection, this is the secondary infection. Uh, the difference between the two is number one, you know, they're caused by two different viruses. So that means you know there has to be two different kinds of treatment, right? You know the source is different; you have to treat them differently. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, the manifestation of this varicella zoster virus causing shingles is totally different. You know, this actually is a unilateral; it actually goes around this dermatome distribution in the body.
Um, so um, <clears throat> we started our studies with EBV uh, many years ago, looking at, uh, as I said, you know, we started to look, look at EBV Epstein Barr virus, uh, so which was this. And we found this virus is shed in larger quantity in astronauts during space flight. That actually answered our this question that you know whether or not this was this was asso associated with changes in immunity. Yeah, you know. So as the immune system goes down, we actually have a pretty good uh, uh, reactivation and shedding of this virus. So we publish all those work, you know, which we took, we, we, which, which I'm saying, you know, it has all, already been published in peer-reviewed journals. But, you know, if EBV was shed in larger quantities, you know, it really does not help NASA to solve anything. So NASA is saying, okay, this is, this is a great uh, study, you know, this is uh, good information that, you know, immune system is related with the viruses, but our astronauts are fine, you know, they don't have any problem. Why do we need to worry about viruses? Again, coming back to your question. So I said, okay, uh, let's look at another virus, which is varicella zoster virus. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, primary infection for, for this VZV is the chickenpox, and as I said, you know, chickenpox, you know, is uh, uh, the symptoms of the chickenpox are healed in about a week or two, but the virus stays in the body. And then this virus can reactivate after maybe 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, you know, who knows, you know, and this can cause disease, you know, which is caused shingles. Uh, or zoster. You guys are familiar with that, right? So those um, of us who had this disease can tell you it's a very painful disease. It's a very, very painful disease. And not only the disease, you know, after the disease again heals up, the pain left from that, the, 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 those vesicles does not go away. And here is a picture of one of the uh, patients, you know, so one of our, our, our colleagues, you know, from University of Colorado, he's uh, chairman of neurology, and he gave me this picture. So he said, you know, he went for a round one day and asked his patient, so how are you doing? Uh, and the patient said, doc, can I answer this question to you tomorrow? He said, yeah, sure. So next day when he went to ask the question same from the patient, and the patient gave him this picture, he says, this is how I feel. My body, I'm so tired, I'm so fed up from this pain, you know, which I'm having from, I mean, there is nothing, you know, I mean, all the, all the, all the symptoms are, are, are healed up, you know, but the pain doesn't go away. And this kind of pain is called post-herpetic neuralgia. And this pain can last for, for a very, very long time. Actually, as a matter of fact, I have a patient in my study where we have seen pain lasting up to 12 years after the symptoms are healed. So, you know, yesterday, you know, we, somebody was talking about this. Is, this pain is bad, is, 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 is worse than even having a, a pain from childbirth. So it is, it is that painful. So uh, I'm not trying to, you know, make a huge deal out of that. But the thing is, you know, once this virus reactivates and start to produce these symptoms, it could be really uh, bad to the extent that it needs to be taken care of right away. And and again, you know, this is a, and not only, not only the skin, not only the, you know, uh, uh, dermatologist, you know, we need to be taking care of. There are some other manifestation of this disease also. This disease, you know, the virus, you know, instead of going into the, coming back to the skin, it can go to the other side, you know, it can, it can cause vasculopathy. So now there have been um, uh, uh, varicella zoster virus have known to be associated in the recent studies with the stroke, with heart disease, with MS, so with the eye infection, you know. As a matter of fact, you know, I work with a, with a doctor here, you may know, you know, it's in Fuqua, Dr. Lipsky, uh, he's an uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, uh, ophthalmologist. He sends me his patients' samples uh, to test whether or not they have HSV-1 or VZV. First of all, as I said, there is no test available. There is no laboratory test available to test whether or not, you know, if this is a virus disease, number one. And we not only test this is virus or not, we are able to test, you know, which virus it is. And based upon that, you know, the treatment can be done. So when you say larger quantities in space flight for the EBV, 
are you saying that there's some growth or activity that's turned on when they're in space? Or growth of what? The EBV virus? We have not cultured those virus. EBV was not cultured during the uh, flight time, but VCV was, yes. Varicella zoster virus, we were able to grow varicella zoster virus uh, during space flight. Uh, yeah, I, I was referring to the comment you made about noticing in larger quantities. Oh, larger, this is, this is all DNA-based test. Okay. Um, I think I'll uh, have some data to show you. Because these viruses, these are all DNA-based viruses. Culturing virus is a very, very difficult thing. I have cultured one time, but for that, you know, I was in Kennedy Space Center and astronaut after it landed, he was sitting here and I was here, you know, took the sample and put it into the, my setup right away. There is no way I can do, not only here at NASA, even in the clinics also. So it's, it's a little difficult, you know, to get the sample. It's a very labile virus and it denatures as I bring the sample back to my lab. But we were able to culture uh, Varicella zoster virus is a great, again great question because DNA could be not infectious. If this is a DNA, you know, it's not going to cause any infection. But it has to be intact virus to be able to produce a disease. On the manifestation of the shingles phenomenon, is that uh, affecting nerve endings? Is that why they have prolonged pain after the disease? You're right. You're right. Yeah. So, you're right. Absolutely. So, nerve endings go and wherever the dermatome, whatever dermatome is re- Okay, this VZV is present in all the dermatome, in, 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 dor in the dorsal root ganglion, and uh, it is distributed throughout the body. So, whichever dermatome gets reactivated, and wherever the uh, uh, you know, manifestation of the dermatome is, it will actually start to show up. <clears throat> So, um, so we are trying to, let me see, I think I'm running late. Am I okay with time? You have five days for time, they let you know. Okay. You have to send her. Okay. So, um, so now we will be talking about, you know, viruses, virus reactivation in space. Do other human herpes viruses reactivate in space? Uh, answer is yes. Um, but we don't know much, you know. I have only studied herpes viruses, eight different herpes viruses we have studied. And, you know, if everything is under the control of immune system, you know, uh, yeah, you know, so there may be possibility, but we haven't studied those. But herpes viruses are the one, they are latent and they are related with the infectivity part also. Uh, do other uh, viruses reactivate in astronauts? Uh, you know, we have, uh, we, we have studies showing CMV uh, besides uh, EBV uh, does uh, reactivate in space. Uh, and of course, you know, these two viruses, you know, the body fluid is different. CMV is shed in urine and EBV is shed in saliva. And, um, uh, you know, I think another interesting question is, you know, does this uh, reactivation or the shedding of these viruses increase as the duration of the flight increase? Uh, so these are some of the questions, you know, and I'll not answer this at this time, but, uh, you know, let me have some data to, to, to support this first. Uh, so, so let's see what is the mechanism, you know, that really causes these viruses to reactivate. So as I said, you know, astronauts are healthy individuals, you know, so they do not, they should not be reactivating or they should not be producing these viruses, you know, if their immune system is intact, like, you know, when so, but what happens, you know, this is a stress, and this is we, stress associated with, with, the, with space flight is the one, you know, that is the main culprit. And I'm going to give you some general mechanism how stress really causes these uh, viruses to reactivate. Uh, there are two, um, um, uh, hypoth two, 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 two pathways. One is hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. Uh, so that is, you know, I mean, if we have any kind of stress, so that stress affects uh, our brain through this hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis and causes release of stress hormones, you know. And the stress hormone we normally take uh, for these studies is, say, for example, cortisol. So cortisol is released in response to stress. And uh, if there is enough cortisol released and the stress doesn't shut off, more and more cortisol or more and more stress hormone can suppress 
the immune system and suppressed immune system as I said you know if you have intact immune system you know. So, there is always a reactivation of the virus is going on, but every time a virus reactivates immune system you know pushes it down every time you know, but if you have a little weakness little bit you know less immune system intact. So, this virus you know has an upper hand and it keeps on uh, reactivating and maybe shedding also. So, that is how you know this is the increased reactivation of herpes viruses and can cause some clinical symptoms also including uh, allergies or things like that. So, this is, but you know say for example that uh, you know you are running for you are running late for a meeting, you are stuck in the traffic or your car broke or something happened you know you are not able to make it you know. So, that is where you know your anxiety keeps on increasing, increasing, increasing right. So, but you know when you arrive at a point you know where you are supposed to give a talk you are supposed to meet somebody say you know I am sorry my car was broken. So, that is the thing happened you know. So, that is it. So, that is called stress was there, but that stress was short lived. So, here you know like you know if you have a loss of a loved one in your family you know lose your job have a chronic illness or any of those kinds of things. So, that is a chronic kind of stress. So, if the stress is short lived, so here is a stress response and you see a lot of cortisol you know being released you know from uh, from that response and once the cortisol once the stress response goes away, uh, it actually inhibits its own synthesis cortisol is cortisol synthesis is stopped by feedback inhibition once the stress goes away. But if stress does not go away then more and more cortisol is released and this more and more cortisol can cause this immune system go down. And uh, this could be by HPA axis and sympathetic adrenal nervous system also. Uh, here is a, um, a good example you know how this chicken pox as I was saying you know you have chicken pox you know and the chicken pox after a couple of weeks uh, you know. Uh, you know these, these are the symptoms in couple of weeks you know virus stays in the body and does not leave the body you know it starts to come out at the skin surface you know to produce these sim symptoms. But you know this can stay in the body and stay for a long period of time until it actually can reactivate and break into another kind of symptoms causing shingles. So, what causes shingles you know this is a very good question. Uh, people have not been able to find answer to that there are all kinds of theories in uh, in support of that uh, of course, uh, stress plays a major role. So, we all uh, ok. So, I think we just talked about that uh, here is some data uh, to show how salivary cortisol and um, uh, most of my work that I will be showing some data also. Uh, this is done on saliva. Uh, we try to use saliva, saliva being one of the very easy body fluid to take and run uh, and we can take multiple samples of saliva as compared to blood or urine or CSF as I said it is it is called almost impossible to take. So, and uh, all the all the uh, assays that I have done in my lab uh, we have validated to make sure they are related with their values you know relatively they are correlated directly with the uh, with their values in plasma. So, so say for example, you know this is the uh, cortisol you know before flight uh, then uh, during flight and after flight. If you look at that you know there does not look to be major difference between the two, but uh, you know this is little bit more you know cortisol is little bit again you know astronauts when they come back you know they are not stressed you know you you talk to any astronaut is, are you stressed say, no I am not. Uh, but uh, there is some physiological stress you know which is reflected in ast in, 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 in salivary cortisol uh, 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 measurements. And this is the um, th this is the space shuttle you know two weeks uh, duration. Uh, you do not see much of increase in salivary cortisol during flight, but here you see a major increase you know again you know answering that question does these things change 
or does the intensity of reactivation or cortisol or any of those things increase as the duration of flight increases? Yes, answer to that is yes, you know. Once you have a higher duration of in flight, you have a bigger effect also of these things. Um, you know, space flight um, um, affects multiple uh, physiological systems. You know, you have heard, you know, all these things. You know, you know, bone, bone, uh, muscle loss, and all flu fluid shifts. All those kinds of things are there. But we are focusing on the immune system, and the immune system. And I'm trying to answer changes of immune system by using viruses as a biomarker. Uh, and the viruses, as I said, you know, so these are the herpes viruses. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about the immune system. As you all know, you know, this is the one of the largest tissue in human body, uh, and is responsible for protection against number of things, including viruses and bacterial infections. And uh, dysregulation can result in increased infection rate you know, a number of other diseases, you know, we don't want to have. Uh, so, I mean, it has number of cells and we have actually studied in our lab number of uh, individual immune cells also. When I say individual, I'm talking about maybe NK cell cytotoxicity, neutrophil function tests, monocytes. So, we have done all those individual tests and we have shown that these functions significantly go down after space flight. But again, you know, when you show one type of cell going down in activity after space flight, does it show in astronauts' health? No, it doesn't. So then what is the use of that? So that is why, you know, we actually want to use a little global approach, you know, there where we want to look at the effect of overall effect of changes in immunity or suppressed immune system to uh, one of the body functions, and one of them is, you know, to keep these viruses in check. Dr. Mehta? Yes, sir. Is there a reduction in cell numbers and immune cell numbers or a reduction in function? Exactly. Uh, uh, no, there is not a reduction in the cell number. Actually, there is an increase in the cell number. Like in a neutrophil function, you know, it go, a neutrophil number, you know, that goes up but the function goes down. And same is with NK cells also. Because, you know, uh, you know that there's a fluid loss, you know, like, you know, when they, when they are in space, you know, so the, there's a total blood volume loss, you know, so water is less, so the concentration of the cells, that increases number-wise. Um, here is um, a, couple, a couple of slides to show how the function of uh, T cells go down, uh, you know, during space flight as compared to their normal functions, uh, you know, and then it comes back, you know, at recovery. So this recovery period could be, you know, variable, you know, for different uh, subjects. Uh, so this is a little overall cartoon we have made, you know, just to show how uh, different uh, aspects of space flight can cause different changes, you know, the, the, the factors, you know, that are responsible for changes in human health include radiation, microbes, you know, so there have been studies showing, you know, the virulence of some of the microorganism does increase during space flight though. And stress, we talked about that, microgravity, I didn't touch that so far, you know, that also is another contributory factor, you know, to cause this stress type environment of the space. Uh, disrupted circadian rhythm. Uh, circadian rhythm, you know, so I showed uh, the cortisol data, but I didn't talk about circadian rhythm. That also is very important, you know, for the for circadian rhythm of cortisol. Say, for example, you know, when you wake up in the morning, first thing in the morning, you know, you wake up, you know, you open up your eyes, uh, your brain is up, and you start thinking about that. Okay, you know, it's 6 o'clock, I need to get ready. But you do not leave your bed. You are still in your bed, you know, you just open up your eye and your brain starts to work. Then you stay there for another 5-10 minutes, you know, and during those 5-10 minutes, your activity of the brain has already started and the cortisol accumulation, you know, or the release of cortisol 
increases. So this is the largest increase, you know. So what we do, we actually take sample from crew members as soon as they wake up. Then we take samples 30 minutes after they wake up. Then we take samples, uh, you know, six hours after they wake up. So it's like that, you know, this is a very sharp peak of cortisol within 30 minutes after they wake up. And then it starts to come down during the day. So this is actually a normal, and this is a normal pattern, you know. So you have to have this kind of a normal pattern. But sometimes, you know, in astronaut studies we have seen, you know, so this one is the cortisol level changes, other is even the circadian rhythm, that also changes. You know, the peak which you are supposed to be seeing in every subject 30 minutes after they wake up, that changes. So, and of course, you know, isolation, uh, all those things, you know, they can cause uh, reduced immune function, altered cytokine balance, latent virus reactivation, and incidence. And any of those kinds of things, you know, which are in red, you know, can happen due to, due to the changes of immunity. Uh, so what we do, we take, uh, during our space flight experiments, we take uh, pre-flight samples, we take early in the in-flight samples, mid-flight samples, late within, you know, close to the landing type, and then, uh, you know, at landing and 30 days after landing. So we try to take, uh, uh, you know, we, we try to take samples throughout the space flight uh, time so that, you know, so this is supposed to be our baseline, like, you know, the six months before flight, and here, uh, we would like to take six months after space flight so that, uh, 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 you know, like all these L minus 45, or we used to take samples L minus 10, those are not baseline samples, you know, there's a lot of activity going on, you know, in astronauts and things have already changed. Um, uh, I just put in this slide uh, to make sure, you know, people from NASA realize, you know, we just did not dream of these studies to just do one-off days, you know. So these were some of the recommendations, you know, they were made to us uh, by some NASA, uh, uh, some meetings, you know, they had. And these were some critical questions, you know, they needed to be answered. And uh, so uh, based upon their recommendation, based upon NASA's recommendations, you know, we have started to answer these questions. Um, I think, uh, <clears throat> so basically we have uh, two types of space flight studies, short and long, and uh, also space analog. As you know, you know, if you are working at NASA, you would know any space flight study you want to do, before that you need to validate your things, you need to make sure your protocol works, your everything standardized. And if there is an opportunity for you to work or test your experiment on a space analog, so you want to do that. So we have done all these, you know, all these studies have been done in Antarctica. We have done in um, underwater studies, NEMO. We have done in closed chamber. And we have done in bed rest. Uh, and we have looked at, you know, how viruses, uh, uh, virus shedding change. Uh, again, you know, all these, analogs, they are different from one another and also that is depicted in the, in the results also. And I think I have a slide of results, I will talk from there. So um, let me have all these things. So these are some of our space flight, uh, space shuttle data. Um, you know, so this is EBV, uh, this is during flight and this is before flight. You know, you know how this during flight, the shedding is so high, it is about tenfold more than, you know, I mean, if you look at the numbers also, it's a 40 here, 40 copies, and here I have 417 copies. After flight, it was 44. So this was a very clear indication that reactivation of these viruses or the shedding of the viruses does increase during space flight. And if you look at this line going up, that shows, you know, as the duration of space flight increases, the reactivation of the shedding of the virus also increase. And this is a significant line, by the way. It was drawn by our statistician. Um, <clears throat> so here is data showing different analogs. I showed you a slide before 
uh, NEMO, Antarctic, Space Shuttle, MIR, ISS kind of things. If you look at that, you know, uh, in NEMO, we do see shedding. It's a very sensitive indicator. You know, viral shedding is a very sensitive indicator of stress. You know, if you are a little bit stressed, you know, it's going to show up in your saliva samples. And we do see a little, you know, maybe two-fold increase in NEMO. We see about five-fold increase in our Antarctic studies. You know, Antarctic is also a pretty stressful environment, you know, where the temperature, you know, pretty harsh. Uh, we are away from your family and friends for a long period of time. And we see about five-fold increase in viruses. And space shuttle, I sure, is about ten-fold increase. Longer duration space flight, you know, we have shown up to 25-fold increase. So, you know, it really is very clear to us, you know, as the duration of space flight increases, the impact or the shedding of the viruses also increase. And same is clear uh, even with the immune results. So, um, then we thought, you know, um, Let's see if this is not only true with one virus. These were, by the way, EBV, Epstein-Barr virus. Then we looked at CMV. It's a cytomegalovirus. It's an immunosuppressive virus. It is shed in urine. And it is another one of the herpes viruses. And uh, this is the virus you, know, you normally do not see in normal healthy adult. This was taken in urine samples. And you know, I got only one out of 61 um, subjects I had taken for my control and here you know so there were 71 individuals you know uh, this was total of 71 and I saw about 25 28 percent of astronauts shedding this virus and uh, so then we looked at VZV I explained a little bit more on that you know so these are VZV copies varicella zoster virus varicella zoster virus is a very specific uh, virus, you do not see this virus in um, uh, in the normal healthy subjects. So I looked at it in, 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 in saliva. Uh, again, you know, this is a neurotropic virus. If you talk to any, any neurologist that you heard from somebody today that he was saying that VZV virus can be found in saliva, chances are if he doesn't know me or if he has not studied the latest literature, he will not agree. He will not. He'll say, you know, you may have heard something wrong. It is not possible. It is absolutely not possible to see this virus, VZV, in saliva because this is a neurotropic virus. This virus is in the nerves. You know, there is no way that can show up in saliva. I even, when I presented my work about 15 years ago at one of the international herpes virus meeting, there are all virologists, you know, sitting all over the world, and they say they kind of. They didn't literally laughed at me, but they did not believe in what I was saying. As a matter of fact, you know, they were saying you need to go back afterwards. They said you need to go back and retest your samples and then see you know, if it's possible because it doesn't make any sense. And all those people who didn't believe in me 15 years ago, they all are my collaborators now and they are included in that list I showed first. So we from NASA, I'm very proud to say that we are the first one to show that this virus can be found in saliva and it could be used for the diagnostic purposes. And it's very, very specific. If this virus is not there in saliva, it doesn't mean anything. But if it is there in saliva, it definitely means something. We are talking about VZV now, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> VZV can occur in any kind of stressful conditions. Okay. Space flight, we know that it's pretty, pretty much stressful, you know. You know, and there are a lot of other factors also involved in space flight that includes radiations, microgravity, crowded environment, and all those things. So, space flight, you know, is the first study where we showed. This virus was shed in saliva of astronauts asymptomatically. Our astronauts were not sick. Um, so, but I have more to say on this point, you know, if you can just, you know, give me one yeah, more second. I was just curious, if, since they, they didn't accept your claim, yeah. they now, now that they spend this time with, with you and your research, have they now found it? 
Yeah. You're in the clinical studies that they can actually identify. These That's patterns. right. That that is exactly right. That is what I also want to find out. You know. Okay. You know, I have found saliva from asymptomatic astronauts. I have found this virus in asymptomatic astronauts. And does this? I mean, if this 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 thing is really true, then I need to be able to see in the positive control also. Then I went to take samples from uh, shingles patients who are really diagnosed, you know, confirmed or diagnosed cases of shingles patient, you know, and we wanted to see if this virus was present in saliva. And we tested it was present in saliva, it is present in saliva. I'm going to show you that data in a second about that. And now, uh, so that claim that I made 15 years ago is fully accepted by other clinicians also. You know, they actually use this test in their clinics, saliva tests, you know, to, to, to see if this virus is, uh, or if the, the, their clinical diagnosis is confirmed. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to skip some of these slides because uh, I think I want to talk more on the clinical part. Uh, so this is, uh, <clears throat> this is our varicella zoster virus numbers in astronauts, okay? So when I found these numbers and uh, there are no symptoms in, um, in astronauts. Um, by the way, just to make my point clear, we have seen shingles cases in astronauts before flight. As a matter of fact, now I have published uh, in my paper uh, that is how I started to look at these viruses. You know, many years ago, I was making a presentation to astronauts for, 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 for doing our space experiments, and one of the crew member, you know, he told me, oh, he had shingles. So we followed up with all those studies, all the investigations on him, and found this is a real thing. So that happened before flight, a couple of days before flight, and, uh, uh, you know, we then, you know, if, if this thing was true in saliva, then we took saliva from shingles patients. You know, we work with a, uh, a, a dermatologist, who's, uh, his name is Steve Tearing, if I don't know if any one of you would know. Uh, he is my shingles patient's uh, kind of provider. So I took samples from the shingles patients and found this virus was also present in shingles patients. However, if you look at that, you know, the amount of this virus present in astronauts in the asymptomatic condition was much lower as compared to what we see in shingles patients. However, you know, so the upper limit of what we see in astronaut is very much, you know, <coughs> within the range what we see in symptoms or the symptomatic patients. So, so that was, uh, uh, this was the paper I published in 2008, I think. And you see, so th there's definitely a, a overlap of what we see in astronauts uh, with the real uh, patient uh, group. Uh, any question on that, did you? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> so, um, as I said, you know, this was present in, 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 uh, in saliva, and when we talk with the clinicians, you know, they got really interested. As I said, you know, there is not any laboratory test available to diagnose shingles or chickenpox, except for the clinical symptoms. You go to a doctor, doctor looks at you, takes your history, and he or she will make a diagnosis based upon their experience and the clinical manifestation. But, you know, many a times, you know, like, you know, 99 percent, I would say, doctors are very right. You know, they have a lot of experience than us, you know, because they see these patients every day in and out. But there could be a possibility of making an error or missing a diagnosis. So that is where, you know, people like us can come in. Uh, so what we were trying to see, uh, you know, if this virus where this virus is present in saliva, now I'm trying to make my, my, my assays a little bit more attractive or easy for a clinical use. We had been actually, it had been taking me 24 hours, you know, after I would get a sample from a doctor's patient's clinic. It'll take me about 24 hours, you know, to give me the results, about, you know, 
I don't know about six, seven years ago. Then I improved my assay. It would take me about six hours. And now I have done some more modification. I can give you results one hour after I got my sample. And uh, uh, this is going to be a little bit more, uh, you know, basic uh, information. You know, I thought you might be interested. If you look at that, you know, this movie is showing, you know, this is where this VZV antigen is present. All this green is VZV. And this is one of the saliva cells. Uh, this is the epithelial cells in saliva. So I wanted to see, you know, I mean, if this is in saliva, as you all know, saliva is very viscous. And especially I take saliva first thing in the morning. So first thing in the morning, when you take saliva sample, you know, it is more thick, it is more viscous. So then I would take, then I have to spin that sample, you know, to take my cells out of that. You know, it takes about two to three hours in my lab. You know, I have a centrifuge running that. And uh, so the question was, I wanted to find out, you know, where this virus is exactly present. If it is present only in the cells, you know, maybe we can have some, some shortcuts. So I found, you know, so this virus was present only on the cells. And if this is present only on the cells, you know, uh, so this is, this, is a, this is a negative cell. That is how a negative cell would look. You know, you don't see any green uh, fluorescence of the virus. So again, you know, this is our uh, contribution to this virology field to show them where this virus is present uh, in saliva, which cells contain this virus. And uh, after we found that, uh, we wanted to <clears throat> improve our assays. And now, you know, I take the, assay, I take the cells out from saliva and uh, extract my DNA and do PCR, you know, what are, this is a PCR based assay. Uh, I hope some of you know what PCR is, you know, this is a polymerase chain reaction where you amplify DNA copies, you know, from very small, because this is a virus we are talking, these are very already in a small minute numbers. So you need to have some mechanism, you know, where you are amplify the signal to multiple folds and you are able to detect that. And polymerase chain reaction is the one, you know, uh, which really helps. Uh, uh. So, um, so some of the major contributions of space flight studies to patient care. Um, by the way, all these studies that I am talking about, you know, we really cater these services free of cost to dermatologists here uh, within NASA, I mean, within Houston, um, and also within country. I get samples all over the country, you know. Uh, I'm, we are the only lab uh, in the United States, you know, who uses saliva and who has these assays validated and available also. Uh, again, you know, we do not do it on the commercial basis, you know. So this is just all still uh, curiosity-based research, you know, we do. but. Um, uh, we were the first one to show VCV can asymptomatically reactivate and shed in saliva. Um, then uh, the other question, I think um, um, somebody, yeah, you asked me the very, you know, first, so is this virus uh, infectious or have you grown this virus? VCV shed in saliva is infectious. If you are able to grow this virus, and if this is infectious, you know that, you know, if this virus is infectious, uh, infectious means, you know, you can infect somebody else. However, from chicken, from, from shingles, you do not get shingles from shingles. You get chicken pox from shingles. And you get shingles from primary infection of chicken pox that is sitting latent in your body for a number of years. You know, it's, it's, it's a little confusing, you know, but shingles is a disease. Shingles and chickenpox is caused by the same virus, but if you are shedding infectious virus, I mean, now the question is, is it, then what is the risk about that, you know, even if you are shedding virus, even if you are infectious, even if you are shedding infectious virus, what is the risk to other person? People already have that virus. Yeah, you know, 85 percent of healthy human adults, you know, have this chickenpox virus. But still, there are 15 percent who do not have, or there could be another, you know, a major percentage of people whose immune system is not that intact, 
and they may not be able to defend themselves you know, against the new infectious virus. Third, there is a pretty big risk to pregnant women, you know, children you know, who are totally <coughs> zero negative for this virus. So once you have, and you know, chickenpox in adult is not a fun thing to have. You know. it's, it, it could be more dangerous, it could be more severe. Um, so <clears throat> shingle patients shed VZV in saliva and exhibit viremia. Uh, that was another contribution of ours. Uh, viremia is a virus present in blood. And again, you know, the old school of virology people, they were just thinking that this is just present in CSF. It is a nervous tissue related virus. It has to be, it's a neurotropic virus. It has to be there in the nervous system. And as a matter of fact, you know, that is how they have been testing this virus earlier. They would take a spinal tap and look at, you know, if this virus is present or not. So we, we were able to show that this virus uh, is also present in blood. And then uh, PHN, this is a post-herpetic neuralgia uh, patients, they can also shed this virus for a number of years. Uh, <clears throat> then, uh, you know, um, you may have heard, you know, there is a vaccine that has come out, uh, that uh, vaccine against, uh, chicken, against uh, uh, shingles. It's called uh, Zostavax. Uh, that was the vaccine came out by Merck, and um, uh, you know, you know the thing is, you know, they recommend this va this vaccine given to only people above the age of 60. Now they have reduced the age from 60 to 50. But again, this var this vaccine is only effective up to 50 percent. Uh, but one of the thing, you know, they did not clarify that uh, after this vaccine is given to the vaccinees, vaccinees, you know, keep shedding this virus, or they say, you know, keep pregnant women, immunocompromised uh, patients and children away from vaccinees. For how long, it was not clear. So I did that study, uh, you know, for the patients, uh, you know, who were given Zostavax, who were given this vaccine, and we took saliva from them, and we saw this virus was shed even up to 28 days. And, uh, you know, when I presented these work, you know, these Merck people came after me again. This is, what are you trying to tell us, you know? Are you trying to tell us that we should not be using this vaccine, you know? So is it going to be, are you trying to stop usage of this vaccine? I said, no, I'm not saying anything, you know, it's only the DNA part, you know? So this Zostavax, after it's given, you know, VZV DNA is shed in saliva up to 28 days. But that does not mean this is infectious virus. You know, we still need to do more studies, you know, to be able to produce, to be able to, you know, have that thing very clearly uh, uh, answered. And PCR can be used as a rapid uh, test. You know, I think, you know, that is, that is the key thing. You know, that is what we do here at NASA. We use PCR uh, to diagnose uh, or to test this virus. Um, um, besides these uh, patient studies, you know, we, we, we have, uh, you know, in vitro studies also, we grow this virus in our lab and uh, see, you know, if this virus can be grown and uh, because for infectivity studies, you have to grow the virus in, uh, in your lab. And what we have seen, you know, if you look at that, you know, so these are all viral copies pre-flight you don't see any uh, so any virus as i said you know pre-flight you are not supposed to be seeing if you take saliva sample from healthy individuals you should not see this virus in saliva so astronauts are people like you and us right you know everyone they are the same they are not different human being so there is no reason for them to show this virus but this virus you know during flight you know, we see this virus in their samples, and even after this is this is after flight, so up to five days in the short duration space flight. You know, so we have uh, seen this virus. So this was a little uh, interesting observation we have made. So this, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, the number of shingles cases, as you see, say for example, for every one diagnosed shingle case, there are seven more subclinical reactivation cases due to VCV 
that stay subclinical and that stay undiagnosed. So, um, we, we have a, a visitor right now at this time from University of Colorado. She gave a talk yesterday at USRA Grand Rounds and talked about VZV and made a case very clearly that VZV is not only involved in the two most common diseases, chickenpox and shingles. It can be involved in other things also. And that is why, you know, the number of subclinical reactivation cases are much more than, uh, than, we, uh, than we can um, think of. One of the, uh, uh, actually she, she mentioned two new types of manifestations due to VZV. One was burning mouth syndrome. You know, so this was a patient actually, you know, this is a type of patients who have burning mouth syndrome uh, and that stays for a long period of time and you go to the doctor, they are not able to diagnose what it is. And she looked at, in her patients, uh, she actually is a doctor, you know, MD. So she looked at in her patients, uh, put them on antiviral and patients started to feel better. And she checked in the lab, you know, so they had HSV1. So this is one type of uh, uh, a new disease that has been known or that has been shown by certain groups to be related uh, with the herpes virus reactivation. And the other is migraine headaches, you know. So she was, uh, so there are patients, you know, who have headache of one side of their face and that uh, lasts for number of days, months to years and found that was also associated with HSV-1 reactivation. So when you put these patients on, uh, on antiviral, patient starts to feel better. You take that, uh, you, you, you stop that antiviral therapy, symptoms come back again. And that virus was also isolated, you know, or it was detected in their saliva samples. <coughs> So, um, so I'm going to talk a few of our interesting cases we came across, uh, uh, you know, during my work. Uh, <clears throat> there was a, a patient of 21 year old. Uh, it was in um, in the doctor uh, Steve Tearing I work with in his clinic. So she has a pain of T12 region. So she has pain of this area and she goes to ER a weekend before that and uh, they ran all kinds of tests on her, did not find a thing. She comes back Monday morning to Dr. Tearing's clinic and uh, tell him that you know, she has been feeling miserable during the weekend and he said, why don't you give a sample to Satish? So she gave me a sample and uh, I found a very small number of 15 copies you know, here in our saliva. So then doctor asked me, what do you think? I said, I really don't know, you know, I mean, I'm good at doing what I do, but you know, this is your area, you need to. I, I said, you know, one thing is clear, you know, we no, normally do not see this virus, you know, if this is a clear, normal, healthy subjects, subject, you don't see this virus in saliva. But the fact we have seen this virus, and this was actually related, she had terrible pain, so, you know, if you look at the pain, so she had pain of about maybe uh, up to 7 in the scale of 0 to 10, 10 being the most severe pain and 0 being nothing. So she had pain up to 7 and viral copies were about 15. He didn't do anything, doctor didn't do anything. So after about 4 days, her pain went from 7 to 9, very bad pain, it was a very severe pain. Her VZV copies went from 15 to 6,500. Put her on the treatment and these things started to come down, pain started to come down. And beauty of this whole test was, or whole case was, this patient didn't have any rash. Shingles, you know, when you have shingles and when you, when you want to diagnose shingles, the first shim symptom of sh shingles is patient would have rash. She didn't have rash. She had pain of unknown origin. And that is what we are saying, you know. It could be, you know, 
it could be virus you know i mean it still is reactivating virus is still working on you know within your body before it makes it way all the way you know through the dermatome and through the nerve endings and you know start showing symptoms uh, that is so this was an early diagnosis of shingles this patient never developed shingles again you know she was put on the treatment as i said you know so she was put on the treatment they tested their blood urine everything so everything started to clear off uh, and in about 30 days you know everything was normal uh, so that was uh, one uh, uh, good usage of the technology we have here at nasa um, here is another case, uh, um, an adult, 44 year old adult came to me um, in my lab <clears throat> about maybe four years ago and asked, you know, uh, this, this person had a little uh, like, you know, maybe mosquito bite on the forearm. Asked me, he says, what do you think it is? I said, I don't know, you know, I'm not a doctor, you know, I'm a PhD, I do things in the lab, but I can't tell you what it is. And this person asked me, do you think this is, this is due to the same virus you work on? I said, I don't know, I can test for you. So I tested that, I took saliva and I tested that, uh, uh, that little lesion and found it was loaded with, 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 with the virus, with VZV, okay? So I, you know, since I work with these kinds of cases, you know, I'm very eager, you know, I'm to find out, you know, what the, what the results are. So next morning, I'm calling this person where this person is, and uh, uh, the person tells me, uh, I'm at uh, my primary care physician's office. You remember we talked about, I showed you something I had on my forearm, and I just wanted to get it checked out, you know, from my doctor. I said, what do your doctor say? Uh, doctor says, it's just like a, you know, a mosquito bite or something, it's going to go away on its own. And I said, no, it's not a mosquito bite. It's not going to go away on, on, on its own. You know, you are coming down with chicken pox. Um, you know, nobody wants to hear this kind of thing, you know, and especially coming from your colleague or a friend. Um, and uh, I said, yeah, please go back to your doctor and, you know, tell this information to the doctor. What do you think a doctor is going to listen to what I do in, here at NASA? So they didn't do anything. So then we actually had our doctors involved, you know, we actually had NASA flight docs involved, contacted that primary care physician and put this person on antiviral right away. And uh, sure enough, you know, so she had chicken pox, you know, in a couple of days, but uh, chicken pox was not as bad as it would have been had uh, the diagnosis or the treatment not done that early. By the way, all these things I'm talking, they are published. So anybody interested, we can. Yes. I wanted to say, too, that shingles is not always just found on the skin. I know people personally who had shingles and it's in the eye. Yeah. Exhibition. Very right. Yeah. You are very right, yes. Uh, that is why we work uh, with Dr. Uh, Bill Lipsky. We are at, you know... Uh, and he sends me samples from his patients of eye infection, saliva, and tears, and I look at that virus, and based upon what we see, put the patient on the treatment. Yeah, actually, um, VZV infection and HSV1 infection of the eye is the leading cause of blindness. Correct, and this person never had any, any yeah, skin right. symptoms, it was just always the eye. Yes. Was it VZV or HSV1, do you know? I don't have all those details. Yeah. I, I mean, it could be both. It could be either of those, you know, but not both. Um, well, this was another kind of um, a corrected diagnosis in the sense, you know, a person has this kind of symptoms and was put on the antiviral treatment and not getting any, any, any benefit out of the treatment. And uh, when we tested that thing in our lab, it didn't have uh, any evidence of this virus in saliva. Uh, and I repeated three times. And I said, I don't think you have shingles. You know, it's not shingles. So, uh, so they changed the diagnosis, you know, with some antibacterial things or something, you know, and got healed up. So it's, it actually works both ways. You know, it helps early diagnosis, the technology we use, and also it helps misdiagnosis of the disease as well. So, uh, Dr. Satish, the 
the, the one that you did, the young lady. Yeah. She came to you one day and only had one lesion on her arm, and by the time they she went to them, the next day she had her whole back. No. Oh. I mean, next day also nothing happened, you know. I mean, next day also this was the same Still small, lesion. small and lesion, that's said, and that's why I say it doesn't look like. Um, um, it didn't look like chicken pox to them. It was only one lesion. Yeah. They said. Insane. I knew her, uh, her history a little bit, you know, because mm -hmm. I said, you know, chicken pox you can only have if you are if you didn't have chicken pox in your childhood, sure. and uh, you know that, you know, <clears throat> you'll be surprised. Um, people all over the world are not vaccinated against chickenpox, you know, when they are child. When, mm -hmm. uh, even in England, you know, I have some studies, you know, going on there. They do not vaccinate their kids uh, against uh, chickenpox. And in Europe also, and in many Asian countries. So many people could have chickenpox type disease at their adult age. So, um, so these were some of the um, uh, questions, you know, which we try to answer based upon our lab uh, tests. Uh, what kind of cells uh, in saliva carry this virus? And uh, based upon the studies we have done, um, I showed you those things. Um, um, <clears throat> Based upon these, these, uh, all the tests we have done in the lab, you know, it shows there is no localization of VZV on the negative control. As I said, you know, VZV is not supposed, this is not a common virus, you know, you would not see this VZV present in healthy adults. So when you take normal control, we don't see anything. But we do see this virus, you know, in the patients of shingles, and we have a clear localization. I'm actually writing a paper right on, on, on this work, you know, uh, so this is brand new work, you know, so uh, people uh, in, again, the virology field are clueless, you know, where this virus is present. That really helps us, you know, speed up our assay from, from six hours to one hour now. Um, so I guess, I've, so two questions, just one of <coughs> Okay, <laughs> that's a very, very good question. I, I'm not sure if I know the answer to that. But I can tell you, a lot of things are still go, still are in works, you know, about what NASA is trying to do in terms of countermeasures. Uh, we, have, we have made our case very clearly that this virus can cause a disease during space flight. We have, we have done multiple studies and in, by clinical, non-clinical, whatever we have done, and we have actually brought people out of NASA. You know, authorities have come and made this case very clearly that virus, herpes viruses can cause problems during space flight. Now, and uh, uh, we are, we have even also tried to recommend that, you know, vaccine should be given. One of the countermeasures is vaccine, you know, Zostavax, you know, so that can be given uh, to astronauts, you know, before they go up. Uh, the other uh, countermeasure, you know, which was very much, uh, you know, recommended by experts was, you know, given, um, uh, to be given is uh, antiviral drug, you know, antiviral, what is that called? Uh, uh, well as cyclovir. So this is a this is a drug which they use acyclovir or well as cyclovir. So these are the drugs you know they are used for treating uh, shingles or chickenpox. And uh, studies are in works or the discussions are in works. You know where are where they are discussing whether or not with flight docs and all you know looking at uh, the after effects of that you know side effects uh, if that. Uh, can be given to astronauts during the entire length of their flight. But again, you know, these are some of the things, you know, some of the major decisions, you know. I'm a researcher, you know, I tell them, you know, so this is what we have found. And again, you're right, you know, from NASA's point, if you are a NASA director, you will say, so what do we do? You know, we need to do something about that. So countermeasure is the next thing, you know, 
uh, we, you know, there are two things, you know, we have to actually tackle from countermeasures point of view. One is what we are talking, you know, giving Zostavax or giving vaccine or giving antiviral drugs. And the other is, you remember the first, uh, you know, in a couple of slides, I made a case what really causes these viruses to reactivate. You know, do we need to hit at the cause, the main reason because of which these viruses are reactivated or we want to hit at the end product. I mean, you go to a doctor, you have a problem, he is going to prescribe you a pill, right? You may want to find out, you know, why you had this problem. And one of the reasons, it's very clear again in every one of our minds that stress is one of the major things. Stress is the main culprit for causing all these problems, including immune changes, including endocrine changes, including whatever change you see. So, uh, there could be something, you know, that, that, you know, that we can maybe propose for, for hitting the stress part of astronauts. So, and my other question, I guess, is, is um, when you're talking a lot about the, the herpes virus here, I don't know how big the, the cell biology lab is, but, I mean, if there work, there's got to be you know, dozens or hundreds of other viruses out there. Are we I mean, this is a million dollar question. I don't have an answer to that. And I said the same thing, you know, uh, in the beginning. There are multiple, and even herpes viruses, you know, I look at eight herpes viruses, you know. I mean, it's not easy to look at even one herpes virus, you know. So, if you, if you know PCR system, I do one, one virus one at a time. So it's a very laborious thing, you know, you do over and over, it's expensive, it's laborious, and then you, you need to be able to reproduce your results. So by the time I'm done doing maybe two viruses or three viruses out of it, either I'm out of my sample or I'm out of my supplies or it gets too expensive, you know, to run all these eight herpes viruses. So we are actually at this time, we are in the process of developing a, an assay, it's called multiplex. We are trying to establish an assay where we can test all eight herpes viruses, you know, whichever one is present, it'll show up. So, but you are right, you know, there are a lot of other viruses also, we do not know. I mean, it's not easy to do, you know, all these viruses, you know, I don't know. Well, that's sort of my question, how do you, how do you pick herpes versus, I mean, Well, herpes, you know, the reason and how we picked herpes, you know, herpes has a direct correlation with the clinical outcome. You know, I mean, you know, this is related with the depressed immune system. This is related with the infectious diseases. You know, I mean, we have seen some cases of shingles and chickenpox in our NASA environment that really prompted us, that kind of suggested us, you know, why don't we look at some of these things, you know, which causes these symptoms? And it turned out to be yes, you know, so this was it. Uh, there are other viruses like, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at other viruses also, uh, uh, you know, adenovirus. Norovirus, you know, so those are the viruses, you know, these are the food or airborne viruses that can cause some digestive uh, disorders. Uh, we are looking into those kinds of things and uh, we have not found, and, and I'll be very honest with you, we have not been able to find those viruses uh, in any of the samples I have gotten, you know. I mean, you don't expect, you know, norovirus, you don't want to be expecting, you know. Um, expect to see in astronauts a stool, say for example. And also the other thing, you know, collecting those samples are, is, is also not that easy. <laughs> you know, asking, you know, to collect stool sample from astronauts and, and then, you know, it has to be transported in the right environment. There's a lot of work, you know, a lot, a lot of coordination needed for doing these kinds of things. But the um, question is great. If there is a, if you have any idea, I will be happy to look into that if we can run it. <coughs> Dr. Satish, you got two other questions. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I had a <coughs> follow-up question based off of her comment, um, given re regarding the shingles um, appearing in the eyes. Have you all done any studies looking at any associations between the elevated BCV and any visual impairment that you've seen in astronauts? No. Um, um, Okay, the, do, the studies we do, we do not do studies from that point of view. I have done my VZV studies, you know, in astronauts, in number of astronauts, and then we try to correlate my findings 
with astronauts eye eyesight impairment i did not find any correlation from my data at least my my very limited data we haven't found anything any correlation so far you have one here <laughs> i keep missing sorry. Uh, yeah sorry this may be from my It can mutate. As a matter of fact, yes, it does, you know. Um, but we haven't studied those. I mean, this, this is theoretically, it is possible. Mm -hmm. And space flight uh, and space stay, like, you know, mutations could be caused by radiations. Uh, it could be caused by other things. Uh, we haven't done that. You know, as a matter of fact, I have a, I have a grant, you know, on the same thing uh, in review right now. You know, if we get a chance, you know, we'll be able to study those. But, you know, it could be very possible. That is the reason we have tried to propose, that we want to look at, you know, if these, these viruses mutate, you know, in space. Okay. And I had another question. So what was the question? I couldn't find it. She didn't hear the question. She <coughs> was wondering if we have done any studies to see if these viruses mutate in space. Okay. We haven't done those studies. As a matter of fact, you know, I got a grant. I got a grant application you know, which is under review right at this time. The other question I had was if it's in epithelial cells, is that only in epithelial cells in the saliva or can you get epithelial cells from anywhere else in the body where there's skin? You know, um, if, if you take lesion of a shingles infected patient, mm -hmm. if you take a lesion of that site, you know, which is infected, yeah, you know, you will see in the epithelial cells, in the blood cells also, in the lymphocytes also, uh, of that infected part. But if you just take uh, epithelial cells of the normal skin, you would not see this virus. It should be, it will be only in the, in saliva. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, you know, this, this virus is a, is a neurotropic virus. This virus is only present in the nervous tissues. You know, so there is no reason for this virus to show up in the skin until and unless it, it really reactivates and travels to the skin. You see? Yes. So I think uh, uh, this, is, this is one more cartoon I just want to, you know, emphasize on. Uh, you know, <clears throat> say for example, you know, a person is having HSV infection, which is, uh, you know, like fever blisters or something like that. And here is the chicken pox case. So after this primary infection, uh, in a couple of weeks, you know, the symptoms go away and, uh, you know, the virus travels and sits in the dorsal root ganglion of the body for rest of your life without causing any problem. Uh, but, you know, during any kind of stressful events, any kind of, uh, you know, changes uh, in the immunity or age, uh, T cell immunity, which actually is responsible for keeping these viruses under check. Uh, so this virus can wake up and travel through the same nerve and produce symptoms like chicken paw, uh, like, like shingles. So, um, let's come to the, um, this part now. So, this is what, uh, you know, when you go to a doctor, doctor examines a patient and makes his diagnosis, right? Based upon clinical history of the patient, based upon his experience or whatever. So, you know, so it will make a diagnosis based upon whatever it is, you know, in case of shingles type thing. So, this is great, you know, as I said, you know, it's very, very good. Uh, except for, you know, in some cases, um, it may not be. So just to avoid that, what we are proposing, you know, so a doctor can still examine the care, uh, patient. We don't want to take that part away from doctor, you know. So we want them to do whatever they are doing based upon their expertise. Uh, take a sample. I mean, we want them to give us a saliva sample and let us run this saliva sample for VZV test. And if this is positive or negative, whatever it is, will give now this patient doctor would have one additional information 
to make his diagnosis and whatever diagnosis he makes now is accurate 100 percent. So that is what we are trying to say. This is a rapid, sensitive and specific PCR assay for VZV. And um, uh, that actually, you know, our uh, asymptomatic shedding of the virus has, has uh, resulted in a new possibility uh, or a new possible etiology of chickenpox. Uh, it's like that, you know, <clears throat> we all, okay, we, when I say we all, all of us, you know, who are infected with chickenpox virus and that could be 90% of the healthy human adults. But we keep shedding this virus asymptomatically. You don't know what next person sitting to you is going through at this time, right? Person could be stressed, person may have some, so there could be some asymptomatic shedding. A healthy adult previously infected with chickenpox can shed VZV asymptomatically during immune system stress. So, so you are shedding this virus throughout, you know, always you are shedding. Some of them are infectious, some of them are non-infectious. So if this is an infectious virus, so there could be some, 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 some children also who are, who are susceptible, susceptible children of unknowingly, like, you know, if this is a, a grandpa, you know, having a kid in his lap playing with him, but, but the grandpa is shedding that virus, you know, asymptomatically. So that virus is picked up by the kid and kid would have chickenpox. So, so this is one possibility, you know. So people always ask, you know, how people, how kids get chickenpox? Kids get chickenpox from the asymptomatic shedding of this virus. And, uh, you know, since this kid's system has not seen this virus before that, so it produces chickenpox. It, and or the other thing could be susceptible adults, you know. They could also be exposed to this virus and can have the same kinds of symptoms. So this is, this is kind of an answer to a very puzzling question to the VCV world, you know, where they were trying to understand, you know, how people would get infected, you know, all of a sudden, you know, so that you would say, you know, this child was okay last night, you know, how come he has this chicken pox? So the thing is, you know, either this person came across with somebody who was asymptomatically shedding that virus and gave it to the chicken, gave it to the kid. So, um, so the applications of space flight technology is to help diagnose shingles, chicken pox, post herpetic neuralgia. We do some studies on the eye infection, as I said, cardiovascular, multiple sclerosis, and some other neurological diseases. So, um, so the scope of studying alpha herpes viruses, you know, 90 percent, you know, 6.5 billion of the world population harbor latent VZV. 33 percent out of that, which is 2 million, will reactivate and develop disease. So virus travels along nerve fiber and have access to every single organ system with the potential to cause disease with or without rash. So, um, I mean, what we are trying to say, you know, so this VZV is not only um, involved in the very only, only two small things, you know, chickenpox and shingles, and shingles, you can say, you know, it's a rare disease. She just mentioned, you know, shingles can also be present in the eye and cause a really infectious problem. And it can also be involved with a stroke, giant cell arthritis, you know, so these are things, you know, I don't want to go over. But it has been involved with a number of other things. GI disease, you know, nobody thought of, you know, VCV could be involved with a GI disease. It is also associated with that. So it's, 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 it's taking really more and more uh, uh, people into consideration to consider how VCV can be involved. Um, and uh, now the critical question is, you know, how frequently do VCV and other alpha helpies viruses in fact, human beings, you know, it all depends upon, you know, a person's uh, situation, you know, stress, age, all kinds of things, you know, uh, that, that can matter. And uh, are these uh, biomarkers can help in diagnosis of the disease? Yes. You know, are, this is a, 
you would say, why do we need to make diagnosis that early? Yeah, you know, one is you don't want to have patients suffering that much. It could be very expensive, you know, in this kind of system we live in, you know, running all kinds of battery of investigations on a patient to make a diagnosis of unknown origin. It could be very, very expensive or it is very, very expensive, we all know. Um, and uh, Dr. Tearing, who is my dermatologist, my, 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 my collaborator, he would actually support this thing. So, and this is a nerve related disease, as I said, you know. So, and it is an irreversible damage to the nerve. So, earlier you are able to diagnose the disease, lesser is the damage to the nerve, and uh, lesser are the chances a person would suffer more and more. So, you know, so this is a very good early marker of the disease. And uh, uh, we, are, we, we, we are trying to use all these assays now. So these are, this is a multiplex I just mentioned a second ago, where we are trying to have, instead of running one sample at a time, if we can run all these eight samples, uh, if we can run one sample for all the eight viruses, and that can give us a peak, you know. So this is an assay still under, yes. I'm not sure. Uh, can you explain a little bit more? What do you mean, natural well, studies? You know, you've talked a lot about, uh, you know, how uh, once the immune system is compromised or weakened, that if you've got this virus uh, present in your system, then this provides an opportunity for it to express. Yeah, proliferate, yeah. Yeah. So my thing is, if you, since most of us, like say 90% of us have been exposed mm -hmm. to chicken pox. Since we know this, um, if a person, if this, the, the virus starts to, you know, flare up again, have there been any studies where people have employed natural diets or meditation, things like that, to help them counteract the effects of the disease? Something non-pharmaceutical, you're asking. Yeah. Basically, yes. Like you're talking about countermeasures now, right? I am, because you yeah. talked about the uh, medicines that are used to treat shingles, but nothing seems to I don't be think there has been any studies <coughs> that have um, come up. However, studies have come, the studies have shown that these kinds of meditations, yoga, uh, have helped uh, keeping the immune system intact. Uh, but no viral related studies have been studied so far, you know, looking at the effect of meditation or yoga. Okay. But I it's a very good idea. I fully agree with you. I'm always, you know, I, I want to support uh, the, the cause effect more than putting a person or a patient on treatment, you know. If there is all, already a disease, you know, if the shingles is already developed, you know, you cannot meditate, you know, to help reduce the symptoms of that disease at that time. It could be done beforehand. I'm very much a propon proponent of using some meditation or some those kinds of things, you know, to alleviate stress, you know, which really cause stress hormones to be released in larger quantities, immune system going down, and viruses getting reactivated and shedding, rather than giving the antiviral treatment at the end. Mm -hmm. No, this is this is this is a great. You know, we need to actually we should find a mechanism. You know, how to do these kinds of studies. Okay, then we can talk more. I just wondered if you were aware of anything like that. No, but this will be a great study to do. <clears throat> um, so I think uh, that is pretty much, you know, I wanted to talk about. I thank you very much for your concentration, for your listening to all kinds of different stories I've been telling. Uh, uh, the last but not the least is, is, is this slide I just wanted to put up here to show you this is one of the current work we are doing. 
uh, where uh, I made a pretty good case, you know, these viruses are shared uh, during space flight, you know, by astronauts. So now we are trying to see, you know, if, if we are able to uh, culture these viruses, if we are able to detect these viruses in the air, you know, of international space flight uh, environment from within. So this is a new study we are doing, you know, we are collecting saliva samples and also air samples, you know, we will be doing that and uh, looking <coughs> at these viruses. Um, I think, uh, you know, I have a lot of other slides also, but I'm pretty much done at this time. Thank you very much for your concentration, for your, for your patience, and uh, if there are any more questions, I'll be happy to answer. Do we have any more questions for Dr. Satish?